conductive wire And you were so electric I had no say when you came so near And just pass right through me Hey everyone, welcome to Geekdom is Back. We are kicking off Marvel Month leading up to Endgame. There are a few movies that I haven't got into just yet, and today Drew Koenig is on to discuss Ant-Man. Somehow, I have not covered this one yet, but we are going to remedy that right now. Drew, I know you and I seem to be roughly on the same page with this movie. It's definitely a heist movie, but it still plays a part in the MCU. Yeah, it, it kind of does that thing that MCU films want to do, but aren't always really great at, which is comic book movies that like take on a kind of genre. Yeah. Like a, another, another example of that being like Winter Soldier trying to be like the 70s espionage movie. Yeah. And this is something that obviously came out before Solo, but I think Solo kind of went along the same lines. It's a Star Wars movie, but it's a heist movie. So yeah, that's yeah. always fun when they do that and they manage to actually accomplish that. But with this, I want to dive into the cast and characters because you have Paul Rudd as Ant-Man, Michael Douglas as Hank Pym, Evangeline Lilly as Hope Van Dyne. You have Corey Stoll as the big bad guy, Darren Cross and Yellow Jacket in this. Bobby Cannavale is in this just because. <laughs> and you get Falcon, played by Anthony Mackie, as a lot of people will already know. But then you still have Judy Greer, Michael Pena, T.I., Haley Atwell, John Slattery, so many names in this movie. And mm. they somehow manage that pretty well. You know, Haley Atwell is playing a much older Peggy Carter than I think a lot of people are used to seeing. And same with Howard Stark. So you have those two characters who are in it briefly at the beginning. And that's sort of just a nod to the MCU as a whole right off the bat, mm -hmm. I think. And it gives you context for how Hank Pym exists in this world. And then he brings in Scott Lang to be at to be Ant-Man. So you have all of these moving pieces and they do bring them together pretty nicely. I would say that Hope is sort of the most underused in this movie. And I think that's probably because they knew Ant-Man and the Wasp was coming next. They wanted to build up to that. So they didn't give her a lot to do. You know, she's basically yeah. an executive assistant who is like <laughs> undercover for her dad. So she's basically... <laughs> willingly being underutilized at work just to kind of destroy the place. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's a very odd setup for her character specifically. Yeah, well like the the biggest obstacle that this movie has to take is like why can't Evangeline Lily be the star of this movie? And that's a big obstacle. And it kind of <laughs> it kind of overcomes that for the most part, but it's still like Evangeline Lily could start, could totally be the star of this movie. Yeah, absolutely. And with Captain Marvel just having come out recently, it's the first time that Marvel has put a female superhero at the front of a film. Even when they put Evangeline Lilly in a bigger role, it was Ant-Man and the Wasp. It wasn't just the Wasp or anything yeah. like that. So it was one of those things where I feel like at the time, they had an idea of who they wanted to introduce as the first solo female superhero and they kind of just spent so much time building up black widow and then they spend quite a bit of time building up the wasp in these two ant-man movies that come but they still did not give either of them solo films which is super weird but it's a thing that happened and now we have a solo female superhero film so yeah i'm willing to move past it at the moment <laughs> and sort of just <laughs> Hope that we get to see more of these characters because, you know, it feels like Ant-Man's been around for a while, but because he hasn't been around quite as long as everyone else, it feels like he could still be used in the future. You know, this movie came out in 2015. Mm -hmm. So you have this happening before Civil War, which introduces us to Spider-Man and Black Panther not necessarily introducing us to them, but introduces them to the MCU. And I think, you know, it'll be interesting to see what they have planned with Ant-Man going forward, but we can discuss more about 
the fit within the MCU as a whole a little bit later, I think we can go ahead and talk about the story because at the heart of it, this is definitely a high story. Hank Pym sets this whole thing up so that Scott Lang will come steal the suit because for whatever reason, he sees something in Scott that makes him want to give this guy a second chance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Hope calls the cops on him when he returns the suit just so Hank can sort of go in, pretend to be his lawyer, and then give him yet another second chance because technically he already got a second chance when he got out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, here's here's something that I that I find really interesting about this movie, and that I was just I was just thinking about while we were talking earlier. Mm -hmm. This is maybe we we talk a lot about like who will take over like Captain America or like Iron Man or Thor's mantle when like these actors are done. But uh -huh. this is like the first next generation film that the MC MCU has done. Right. This is past like the actual character. So you have Scott Lang and you have Hope Van Dyne who are fitting into like Ant-Man and Wasp roles, <laughs> but not the, not in the traditional like Hank Pym or Jan Van Dyne sense, you know? So I think, yeah, I think that's, that's really fascinating. Yeah. Because it's clear that Hank Pym and, Janet Van Dyne were heroes long before these two came around. And obviously, Hope is their daughter. So she's been around for a while, but not in the same sense as heroes. And yet we haven't heard anything about that past within the rest of the context of the MCU, really. Maybe Tony has mentioned Pym here and there, but I cannot confirm that because I clearly did not pay attention to that much detail <laughs> in these movies. <laughs> but it's one of those things where, you know, Ant-Man and the Wasp have such a long history in the comics. It's understandable why they would team them up, first of all. But to not have them really ingrained in the MCU as a whole until, I guess, Civil War. But even when we have Ant-Man and the Wasp, it takes you back out of the MCU as a whole. And I think with this story, you spend a lot more time with Scott Lang. And obviously that's, again, because they're going to build up hope even more in the next movie. So you have this sense of family, really, in this. And I think the thing with this is, you know, Hope pretends to have this sort of broken relationship with her father in front of Darren Cross. But the reality is she still does have this sort of broken relationship. Yeah. Because he's not telling her the whole truth, you know? So he finally brings himself to do that because he's like, okay, now I don't really have a choice. <laughs> no, yeah, there's a lot of like, this, this is like another case of like daddy issues uh, paving way for like story. Yeah. And with Scott, the family thing is more of him wanting to be there for his daughter, even though he's made some very dumb decisions. It's clear that he's very smart, but he got caught doing a very dumb thing because he wasn't smart enough about it. But I believe at the beginning of the movie, he even says that he has a master's for, you know, like being an electrician or so something to that effect. Yeah, it was like electrical engineering, I think. Yeah. So he could be an electrician if he hadn't screwed things up and they make pretty good money. And he could even be an engineer and still make a lot of money <laughs> it is this kind of like redemption arc that like always starts out like the beginning of these marvel movies where like they were kind of dumb in the past and now they're or they were much lesser than what they are now and they have to like gradually make their way up to like this kind of worthiness for hero status yeah not only is this a heist movie but it's also a redemption movie for scott lang because bobby cannavale's character paxton he's a cop and he's now involved in Maggie and Cassie's life. So he's sort of been the father figure while Scott has been locked up. And you can tell that bothers Scott. But at the same time, throughout the movie, you can tell that he understands that Paxton is just doing what he thinks is best. And obviously, exes won't get along with, you know, your ex's new guy or anything like that. So that's pretty natural. But in the end, it's all about his daughter for him. And when we get the massive Thomas the Train 
flying out of the house and the pet ant that is now the size of a dog, <laughs> you know, even then Paxton doesn't turn Scott in. He lets Scott get away because he finally understands what Scott is doing now is solely for Cassie. Yeah. And part of that doesn't entirely work for me. Like um, Scott's Scott's relationship with Paxton towards the end of that mm -hmm. movie doesn't really make sense, but I kind of go with it because I'm like, all right, this is what it is. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it's like you all are buddies now. Okay. I can, I can get on board with that just because that's what, <laughs> that's what yeah. you require me to get on board with. <laughs> the scene after the fact is, a little off and he's like showing Scott the video of Cassie doing a cartwheel and everything like that. I do agree with you that that felt a little off, but when that big fight went down at the end and he lets Scott get away, I was like, okay, these two guys have an understanding between each other that they will both do whatever they can to keep this little girl safe. And I think we probably could have done without that family lunch or dinner scene, whatever it was, <laughs> but you know, like you, I just went with it. And this was one of those Marvel movies where it's not my favorite, but I do have a lot of fun with it. And admittedly, I had not watched this again since I believe the first time I watched it. And I don't even remember. I think I did go see this in theaters, probably. And I think a lot of that has to do with not the story that they told necessarily, but just because of how well they casted this movie. And it's like, okay, you put Paul Rudd and Michael Pena in a movie together and you're clearly going to have some fun with it. Yeah, no, totally. The The best thing this movie has going for it is that it's enjoyable. It's kind of, it's frothy. And that, that comes through with a lot of like, this is like, the, this is, this is a comedy, you know? Yeah. This is a comedy heist film. It's meant to be that it's a kind of, uh, almost oceansy in a way. Um, it's, it's taking the lessons that like, they learn from like guardians of the galaxy where it's like, Oh, this can be really funny <laughs> and we can still make like a solidly decent movie here at least. Yeah. Which, yeah. Which is what a man is, you know, like it's right. a solidly mid tier fun film and it doesn't really require more than that because it's a man. Exactly. Plus you have the fact that humor has been a constant in these movies. So to have this one be a little funnier than most, I would say, because you have these characters who are typically known for their comedic roles and things like that. But then you have, you know, someone like Michael Douglas, who has done a lot of drama movies and things like that, and very serious kind of roles. And he even gets to have a little fun here and there in this movie. But he's obviously sort of the most serious out of all of them, I would say, aside from you know, Darren Cross wanting what he wants and Paxton being a cop, literally. <laughs> yeah. No, totally. And there, there's a kind of like Michael Douglas kind of knows that he's in a ridiculous movie. Yes. <laughs> and he, he and he kind of, he plays that up at times where he's like, this is silly. This is Ant-Man, but whatever. I'm going to do this. I would say all of these science-y words really seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and he does so. And he does so pretty well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think for me with this movie, it is, you know, the first introduction we get to Ant-Man. So prior to this, we don't really get that sort of soft introduction that you get with, like I mentioned earlier, Spider-Man and Black Panther in Civil War later. So they had a lot that they had to accomplish with this movie, the same way they did with Captain Marvel, you know, at the end of Infinity War. Just seeing the pager isn't really a soft introduction to the character. It's like, oh, okay, that's coming next. All right. Yeah. And, you know, this being an origin story on top of everything else, I think it's hard to do that when you don't give these characters those soft introductions, you know. I guess people know Spider-Man well enough in general to where a soft introduction for him makes sense because we all know what's coming with his origin story anyway, pretty much. But I would yeah. argue that Ant-Man might not be one of those instantly recognizable names for everyone necessarily, even though he was very big in the comics. I understand that not everyone who is into these movies necessarily reads the comics especially younger fans because 
the comic book industry just isn't doing quite as well as it was back in the day. I don't think anyway. You know, there are lots of issues going around in that <laughs> industry, which isn't really anything too new. But I think they had a very tall task of not only introducing Ant-Man, but then giving us just enough to lead into Ant-Man and the Wasp with the mid credit scene. Well, yeah, and you you make a movie called Ant Man, and that's a pretty big sell to begin with, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But quickly here, why don't we go ahead and talk about the mid credits scene and the post credit scene? Because the mid credit scene definitely just gives you the oh, okay. So as we probably suspected, for at least some of us, Hope is going to be the Wasp because we see what her mother accomplished and how she risked her life to take down this missile basically <laughs> you know this yeah. giant thing that was going to blow a lot of people up and she made the ultimate sacrifice and at the time of this movie we don't know what happens next you know so i think just giving us that little bit like okay we're going to get the wasp in the next movie but we have no idea what the story will entail and I think that was what they did really well. They didn't really give us any indication until they started releasing Ant-Man and the Wasp trailers as to what the movie would be about. Whereas with some of these, you know, as soon as you see that Captain America Civil War is slated for release, even before you see a trailer, you're like, yeah, I know what that one's about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of already know what that movie is. And that's kind of the cool thing about like having a character like Ant-Man or the Wasp is that there's not quite as much exposure as somebody like uh, Captain America or Spider-Man or Iron Man, where there's a lot of flexibility with that. And I think it, it goes to its credit where like it can do a lot of things and you don't necessarily know what that is. It still fits into a very recognizable formula. Yeah. Or like you can, you can kind of guess from here where like Ant-Man and the Wasp would go from like a plot progression standpoint, but right. you don't, really know because there aren't like famous ant-man stories that you really know outside of like ultron which um, happened before this so. yeah we, yeah which we've already done <laughs> yeah so that's definitely an interesting move on marvel's part too you know they could have introduced ant-man and flip this with age of ultron to then have him appear in age of ultron but instead they have him appear again in civil war which is what the post credit scene is about because you see Bucky, Falcon, and Cap. And, you know, Falcon and Cap are like, yeah, we can't really go to Tony for help, can we? And that really sets you up for Civil War. And it's just a nice little moment. And I think, you know, you don't need to know too much to get the idea of what Civil War is about. Even if you hadn't watched any of the other movies, I mean, it's kind of self explanatory at that point. Yeah. So it was just like, hey, you know, here's what's coming next. And here's a little tidbit on where these three characters are at with it. <laughs> so it was just a nice little nod to the next movie. But before we move on to how this fits into the MCU as a whole, I do want to note that I was not super impressed with the whole Darren Cross storyline. It just kind of was like, eh, yeah, you're the typical jerk who has a lot of money and power. And that's about it. <laughs> and you want the suit and he has a suit and there's too many suits and your ego is too big. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the the problem with Darren Cross is like it falls into like that comic book explanation thing of like the thing has driven him crazy. Just he's crazy. Just go with it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Pay no pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and I mean, your mileage varies and uh <laughs> definitely varies with me um and it's not done as well as i think it would like to be done you just kind of have to go that guy's crazy yeah pretty much and that's where your enjoyment is going to come from that um <laughs> short <laughs> yeah. of that short of that it's very like uh cartoonish right well i know we've talked a little bit about how this fits into the mcu which is to say that it kind of sort of almost doesn't you can tell we're still in that universe because hank pym makes a jab at the ultron situation yeah 
and he talks about the Avengers letting cities fall from the sky or something to that effect. And you sort of just get that little jab in and you're like, okay, you know, this is the same universe, you know, we're on the right timeline and everything like that. And then you have these things happening where he basically grooms Scott to being Ant-Man and then Falcon has the encounter with him. So it's like, okay, you know, we see the new Avengers facility and clearly Falcon is going to remember Scott for what Scott did to him. (laughs) And he's like, I don't ever want Cap to know about this. (laughs) But then, (laughs) you know, at the end of the post credit scene, it says Ant-Man will return. And that is definitely leaning more towards him returning in Civil War because Falcon makes a comment in the end credits scene about possibly knowing a guy he can call or something to that effect. Because yeah. Scott doesn't really play by the rules. He never has, which is why he ended up in jail. So they do a little to shoehorn it him into the MCU as a whole. And I'm not too annoyed by it because it's like, yes, it's an origin story, but you still have to put him somewhere and, you know, give him a purpose in the actual MCU, not just in his own little story here. Yeah. Well, like within within the movie itself, he's allowed to like Ant-Man is allowed to just exist in like its own little world for the most part without necessarily interacting with the rest of it. Yeah. Like this is this isn't Iron Man 2 where it's like aggressively setting things up for the future. It, It is to a certain extent, but. Just, just, and like you said, just as far as civil war is concerned, um, but it's not like <laughs> trying to set up like its own personal universe or anything like that, you know. Um, it's it's really just trying to have fun within like its own parameters. Yeah. Um, which which is good. Like it's it's really standalone in its own way. Right. Basically, they're just adding a new character to the mix that they will use more down the line. And the same can be said for some of the other quote unquote origin stories. You know, sure, Tony Stark appears in Spider Man Homecoming, but for the most part, Peter's story in that movie has nothing to do with what's going on in the MCU as a whole. You know, he's not fighting the big fight, he's dealing with something on a smaller level. And that's the same thing that Scott Lang is doing here as Ant Man. It's like, okay, we need to give this guy something small to start with and sort of build up to him going on these bigger missions and things like that. And he has that moment towards the end too, where he goes subatomic and you don't know in that moment if he's going to come back, but then that sort of gives Hank Pym something to question. He's like, okay, he came back, but my wife didn't. So now you have that whole story that you can follow, at least through Hank's perspective. And I guess that does kind of give you a hint as to what's to come in Ant-Man and the Wasp. In Ant-Man and the Wasp, now that I am thinking back on it. But again, hindsight is twenty twenty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just, just to go back to what you're saying, like there is like this kind of trend in like recent uh, Marvel movies where it's set within this universe but it's allowed to like operate on its own i'm like and it, um i'm thinking of like black panther or captain marvel uh specific or like you said spider-man homecoming where it's part of this universe but it's not uh really trying to like push an avengers narrative really yeah it's not as much set up as the earlier movies were i would say you know the first half of the mcu movies were a lot of building up these characters, getting you to Avengers, getting you to Age of Ultron, and then you kind of go from there. And then you have Captain America Civil War, which might as well be an Avengers movie because they're all in it. Like everyone is in it pretty much <laughs> until you get to yeah. Infinity War and then really everyone is in that. But, you know, even Doctor Strange, that origin story had nothing to do with what was going on outside of you know, Dr. Strange's world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And (laughs) yeah, to bring up Dr. Strange is like, sometimes this works and sometimes it less works. (laughs) Yeah. I think we could move on to some final thoughts with this though. And I like to try and go back and look at what I rated 
these movies, especially the ones that I haven't seen in quite some time, and see if I still agree with those initial ratings today. And with this movie, I did feel that way. I gave it a three out of five on my first impression when I first watched it. And I still feel that way because, you know, like I mentioned earlier, Hope feels a little underused in this movie because she easily could be the star of this movie. And there were just a few things where it's like, yeah, okay, Michael Pena was a little over the top, especially with his storytelling abilities (laughs) or lack thereof, I should say. (laughs) Yeah. What would you rate this movie? Uh, three, Three sounds fair. Maybe yeah. maybe a maybe a little less, but not by much. Like like I said, this is like solidly mid tier Marvel. Um, <laughs> I, I think I mentioned I mentioned this to you on Twitter, but I do another podcast, um, and my co host on there thinks that Ant Man is like the greatest thing to have ever existed, <laughs> and I enjoy just nagging her on about that. But like, <laughs> is she a big Paul Rudd fan? <laughs> One day I'll understand it. I don't yet, but. Um, <laughs> It is, it is like, it's fun. And that's like the best thing that can be said about it. And it's not trying for a lot. Yeah. It just, it just wants to be like an enjoyable experience for you. I totally agree with that. And I know we kept this episode pretty short here, but I get the feeling that, you know, with Endgame coming up, there will be a lot to say about the MCU soon. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, some of these movies they are what they are. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, heist movies are fun. I enjoy all sorts of heist movies. I've watched this. I've watched Solo. I've watched the Oceans movies. I apparently enjoyed Oceans 8 more than quite a few people did. (laughs) And I didn't rank it super high or anything on, you know, my list of movies that I saw. What was it last year? But, you know, Widows, another heist movie. Yeah. So, There are lots of ways you can pull off a heist movie and doing one within the MCU that doesn't involve Loki somehow is not that bad. (laughs) Like it's, it's hard to be upset at Ant-Man, you know? Yeah. (laughs) He's just too funny and nice. And he just gets this look on his face. Like what me? Did I do that? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's like here, here's a fun montage. (laughs) We love montages. Everyone loves montages. Yeah, exactly. And his burglary skills are pretty good. Top notch. (laughs) Even Hank is a little impressed. So that's something. (laughs) And Hank pays him roughly one compliment the (laughs) the entire movie. (laughs) But overall, this is a good time. If anyone hasn't seen it yet, I'm not sure why you just listened to us talk about it. But if that is the case. I hope you end up watching it because, you know, we did talk quite a bit about the story, but I feel like we didn't spoil every single thing in here. So there is that. There's, you know, pretty cool fight scenes with Ant-Man getting small, getting big, getting small again. Love the dynamic between Ant-Man and Falcon. And I think that's where I'll leave my thoughts on this one. Yes. And uh, if, if for some reason you did not already watch like Honey, I shrunk the kids. And a lot of this works for you. <laughs> <laughs> True. On that note, though, Drew, thank you for coming on for a quick discussion on Ant Man. It was uh, it was good to be here. <laughs> finally, finally made it on after like lots of chess cemeteries. <laughs> yeah, there are quite a few of those. Quite a few. I have my work cut out for me with my other podcast right now. <laughs> <laughs> But to our listeners, you can follow us at Geekdom Pod on Twitter, Welcome to Geekdom on Instagram. You can also find us at Welcome to Geekdom on Facebook if you are still using that. I don't use it quite as much as the other two, but it is still there and I will still post the episodes weekly. On that note, though, thank you all for listening and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.